Hi, this is Deboki, and this is Okie Dokie Boki. And before I get into this week's video, I just want to issue a few warnings. I'm going to be talking about Speak by Lori Holtz Anderson, and I'm going to be discussing it in the context of a lot of news and general discourse surrounding rape and rape culture and sexual harassment and sexual assault. Some of this discussion will touch on the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court um, and the multiple allegations of sexual assault that have been made against him, most notably by Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. I will also be talking about some other stories that have come out in the news um, in the past few years, um, and I'll be linking to all of the news articles that I discuss uh, in, down below. So just as a general content warning, this video and those links will be discussing rape and sexual harassment and assault. Um, so if those are topics that are triggering for you, I totally understand. If they're even just exhausting given the climate of a lot of things that have been happening, also totally understand. I'm also going to be discussing Speak in its entirety, so this discussion will contain spoilers. Um, I'm doing this because I want to be able to discuss it um, in a way that even if you haven't read the book before, you'll be able to follow along with the overall discussion, um, and because I have a lot of thoughts about the book in its entirety. Uh, so I'm hoping that even if you haven't read it, you might be interested in sticking around, but if not, I totally understand as well if you'd rather avoid spoilers and maybe read it at a later date. Also totally understandable. One more warning, warning might be a strong word, maybe caveat, I am filming this video on Wednesday, October 3rd, so any discussion of current events is only as up to date as Wednesday evening, October 3rd. So I'm planning to get this video up on Thursday or Friday. I'm sure lots of bullshit will happen by then. We'll find out. Um, so those are the warnings, let's, let's get into the discussion. So I don't know what it's looked like for those of you who are outside the U.S. I know that inside the U.S., for a lot of us women, the last week in particular has been tremendously exhausting. The allegations of sexual assault that have been made against Brett Kavanaugh, Trump's nominee to the Supreme Court, have inspired your sort of standard defensives. Old classics like boys will be boys and it's all a conspiracy. These these defenses that have, you know, pretty contradictory assumptions about whether or not Kavanaugh actually is guilty, but that really seem to hold strong for certain people. And in turn, women are pretty pissed. There's been louder and louder discussions, not just on the treatment of Dr. Christine Blasey Ford by the Senate, but a revisiting of the treatment of Professor Anita Hill when she made allegations against Clarence Thomas of sexual harassment in the 90s. There's also been a revisiting for many women of their own personal stories. I think the most visceral expression of that building rage was when Maria Gallagher and Anna Maria Archilla, two activists, confronted Jeff Flake on an elevator after he said that he would vote for Kavanaugh to go through for a vote to the Senate, a confrontation that may have then set him off on a path to later state that he would only vote after a week-long investigation into the allegations by the FBI. And yeah, I just feel like last week and even this week, it feels very similar to the week where Trump was elected, where you're just like, you're angry and you're tired and kind of the only solace is the fact that other people are also so angry. Like, you're not alone. There's some kind of solidarity that you can find some comfort in. So it's all of this that has somehow led me to wanting to reread Speak. Speak was written by Lori Holtz Anderson in 1999. Written in the first person, it's narrated by Melinda Sordino, a high school freshman who basically starts high school as an outcast um, after she called the cops on a party during the summer. What we eventually find out is that at that fateful party, Melinda was raped by a senior at her high school named Andy Evans. In the aftermath, she's told no one, keeping her thoughts and her trauma to herself and barely communicating with anyone around her. I can't remember exactly when I read Speak for the first time. I'm guessing it was sometime in middle school. This is like my my copy of it and it's probably hard to see on camera, but like the pages are like, you know, actually no, you can definitely see it. Like it's definitely been through some shit. Like there's some water damage. The binding is starting to fall apart. Like I've just read and reread the crap out of this. I think this is one of the first books I read that really dealt with 
rape and I think Melinda as a character just always stuck with me as a she just has this really dark funny voice to her and I think there's a tone to this book that's kind of similar to Heather's where it's like very dark and almost nihilistic but it's rooted in such like a real place of hurt like it's really like she's coming from a place of pain that you can understand where she's coming from and seeing her work through that and seeing how she processes it it's just like a it's it's one of those stories you just get so invested in just seeing her grow and change over the book. At least that's how I feel about it now. I think when I was younger I just thought she was a compelling character. And over the past week I've just found myself thinking about Speak a lot, probably for obvious reasons. There is a high school party, there is a rape, like unfortunately these are things that are relevant in our news. And I decided to reread it because I feel like this book growing up shaped so much of my understanding of rape and I wanted to see how that understanding has or hasn't changed and especially reflect on like how it holds up against a lot of the current news, both with the Kavanaugh allegations and a lot of the discussions around Me Too. I'm going to start with the part of this book that is probably the most obvious but that I don't feel like I really fully grasped until this time around and that's the title Speak. Speaking or Melinda stymied efforts to are so central to this book. Everyone from her parents to her pseudo friends to teachers comment on it and at one point Melinda actually tries to fight for the right to be silent in class, uh, kind of turning to the suffragettes as an example, uh, until one of her friends and classmates points out that the suffragists were fighting for the right to be heard. The struggle is physically manifested in like chapped lips and a feeling that her throat is being constricted. And while the conversation is sparse, the rare bits of it are mostly written to resemble like a script or a screenplay, like name, colon, dialogue. And that basically serves to separate Melinda from the act of speaking, like kind of establishing a distance between her and the actual act. One detail that went like whoosh over my head when I was younger, um, but that seems much more important and borderline heavy handed, um, is this poster that Melinda hangs up in her closet sanctuary that she has in school. Um, it's a poster of Maya Angelou and she doesn't know that much about Angelou, so she I don't think she as a character seems to process this connection, um, but the relationship between Maya Angelou's life story and Melinda is clear and especially Maya Angelou's one of her most famous works, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, that connection is also very clear. Um, kind of like Melinda, I just didn't process those connections when I was younger because I just didn't know that. Significantly, the, the book ends on a line of dialogue from Melinda, which is dialogue that she's speaking to her trusted art teacher. She says, let me tell you about it, which is basically her declaring herself ready to share her story with someone. What was interesting to me this time around is that we the reader don't actually see her telling him this story. And this is a moment that the book is so clearly built toward. And yet it's that ambiguity I think that shows us that Melinda has grown, that she no longer needs to keep the thoughts inside her head that, you know, that basically form this book. She no longer needs to keep those thoughts contained in the book. It, in a sense it's like she doesn't need us anymore and that's good. The challenges and compulsions that Anderson describes around the need to speak stand out especially right now because so much of the ongoing conversation that we have around Me Too and rape culture are made possible in part because women have been able to come forward and speak out. The fundamental idea of this book I think is that Feeling unable to speak up about something that has affected you so deeply, whether it be the result of fear or alienation or more or everything, that is suffocating. You see that mirrored in the stories women have told about why they didn't come forward, especially their fears of how they're going to be treated. As Dr. Ford said in the Washington Post, why suffer through the annihilation if it's not going to matter? The idea of speaking though is complicated and Anderson doesn't present it as some kind of magical cure. The first time Melinda tells anyone about being raped it's to warn her former best friend Rachel who's about to go to prom with Andy. So Melinda tries to warn her off first with an anonymous note driven by a sense of urgency and responsibility for Rachel's well-being. When Rachel seems unconvinced Melinda actually tells her in person face to face exactly what happened to her. And she's met with hostility and disbelief, which only changes later off screen. The urgency that drives Melinda to tell Rachel is the same burden that's placed on so many victims who are expected to publicly bear their traumas to protect others. In her opening statement, Dr. Forrest said, quote, 
I am terrified. I am here because I believe it is my civic duty. Connie Chung, a broadcast journalist, just wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post about a trusted family doctor who sexually assaulted her. And one thing that she notes that kind of stood out to me is, quote, I did not report him to authorities. It never crossed my mind to protect other women. Please understand, I was actually embarrassed about my sexual naivete. I was in my 20s and knew nothing about sex. All I wanted to do was bury the incident in my mind and protect my family." There's an underlying sense of apology to that paragraph, that it should have crossed her mind, as she says, to protect other women. There's no way to know what would have happened if she had come forward. Those stories of predators like Larry Nassar and Harvey Weinstein, whose actions are an open secret, are hardly encouraging. But the expectations that we place on victims to not just survive, but to protect others, is often more than we ask of the structures that are supposed to be in place to protect them. When official structures have failed us, women and girls alike have turned to more unofficial means of protection. When speaking up is too daunting, that's when you turn to whispers. And Speak has maybe the most quintessential pre-social media hub of whispered information, the bathroom. One day while looking at bathroom graffiti, Melinda gets the idea to add some of her own starting a list called Guys to Stay Away From. On her list, there's only one entry, Andy Evans. In the scene immediately following Rachel's rejection of Melinda's admission, one of Melinda's friends actually drags her to the bathroom to show her the fruits of her labor. Underneath Andy Evans is not a blank space, it's a long list of anonymous notes confirming that yes, stay away from that guy. Statements like he's a creep and call the cops that just fill up this bathroom stall. This is the Whisper Network in action. It resembles gossip, but it protects not just the person who's being warned, but the person who's trying to do the warning. I first heard the idea of Whisper Networks when Azeem Gureshi released her first reports on Jeff Marcy, an astrophysicist who at the time was at Berkeley and who had sexually harassed several female astrophysicists. One part of her story that really stood out to me was how often it turned out that women had quietly warned each other to not work for him. These whisper networks were a necessity. As Professor John Asher Johnson, one of Marcy's former students, said, What's really infuriating about this is that anybody of my generation in the field of exoplanets knows that Jeff does this. Everybody is so afraid of doing anything about it that they are afraid of speaking out, but everybody knows it. And as one of the complainants against Marcy told BuzzFeed, when you're a student and you see every complaint being ignored and every male professor who has violated that have zero consequences, it really makes you not want to step forward. Absent of being able to come forward, sometimes the only way to preserve yourself and gain some traction is to do it quietly and hope that you can mitigate some harm. This came to a head in the Me Too era when the shitty men in media list became public knowledge, and that online encapsulation of bathroom graffiti revealed just how many layers of awful behavior women were having to warn each other about. There's an instinctive response when these forms of warning become public knowledge to claim that men are not being given due process. Process. It is so fucking infuriating to exist in a system that is unfair to women and then blames them when they don't trust that system. Where women are somehow treated as both insignificant and wholly accountable, not just for what's done to them, but for what becomes of the men who hurt them. The thing that struck me the most when I got to the end of Speak as an adult, something that definitely didn't occur to me uh, when I was younger and hadn't fully grasped the reality of rape culture, is how Speak has, if not strictly a happy ending, at the very least a not entirely unhappy ending. Towards the end of the book, Andy finds out that Melinda told Rachel that he raped her, and he confronts her in one of the few sanctuaries she has in the school, a janitor's closet. He says, among many other awful things, I never raped anybody. I don't have to. The confrontation turns physical, but it ends with Melinda screaming and holding a broken shard of glass against Evans's throat. The roles are now reversed. She says he cannot speak, that's good enough. It seems strange to describe an ending as happy-ish when it involves a rapist attempting a second rape and our heroine having to hold a broken glass shard against his throat so that she can escape. That's not at all what I would include under the strictures of a happy ending. But for the first time, Melinda is able to say no and fight back and release. 
When she opens the door, she finds the girls' lacrosse team who have heard her screams and are there to help her and presumably corroborate what's happened later on. Ultimately, Belinda is believed, and unfortunately, that's more than many women get. When Dr. Ford sat before the Senate, she shared the story of a traumatic assault that had been done to her decades earlier and that she hadn't shared in the immediate aftermath because she was scared. She's inspired so many women to come forward and share their own stories in, as an expression of solidarity, but she's also faced harassment and death threats while also being denigrated by prominent politicians. There's a really intense story in the Washington Post that was published in the past week or two. It was written by Elizabeth Brunig, and it's about Amber Wyatt, a woman from Brunig's hometown um, who had been raped at a party when she was 16. Amber reported the rape, and she was subsequently harassed into leaving her school. Her story is incredibly hard to read, both in the details from the night of the attack, as well as in the subsequent details of how she was treated by her classmates. There is a follow-up, however, that I hope is telling of a shift in how we understand and talk about rape. After the initial article was published, several of Amber's classmates expressed regret, either for their action or inaction. That follow-up ends with a quote from a woman who also went to that high school at a different time, and who was also raped at a party. She says, Embarrassed to hear talk of it in school the following week, the best thing I felt I could do was minimize the experience. I didn't see it as a violation until much later in life. But even with that follow-up, Amber had to wait more than a decade to get any understanding from her classmates. When I point out the striking difference between how speak ends and how these stories have gone for many women, I don't actually see that as a failure of speak. If anything, that ending is what made this book the right book to read in this moment. Melinda's ability to find her voice and to be heard is cathartic. It's not lost on me either that Melinda opens up that closet door to a girls lacrosse team, which is basically the high school equivalent of a warrior sisterhood. Melinda ends the book feeling less isolated and less powerless than when she started. It's not necessarily an ending that promises that everything is fixed, but it does promise that she has something to look forward to. That's something that should be afforded to everyone in her position, whether or not they've been able to publicly name or confront their attacker and be believed. It's strange now to read speak as an adult, knowing everything I've learned since I first read this book. It's stranger still to cast it against what looks like an older generation of women feeling compelled to publicly bear their traumas, both old and young, all while knowing that a younger generation is watching and seeing how they're treated. Speak was published almost 20 years ago, and if it weren't for the like noticeable lack of internet and social media and smartphones, you could easily believe it was written to be set today. And even though Speak is a YA novel from the 90s, it feels so contemporary. Everything from the language to the pacing to the subject matter to Melinda's characterization, it feels a part of the same category as a lot of popular thrillers today featuring unpolished women processing their traumas. You know, books like the Luckiest Girl Alive, or TV shows like Jessica Jones. It's almost like this book is speaking a certain kind of anger that we've come to recognize across decades and form. When people talk about women and rage in this current moment, that's what I think of. Just how current things that should feel old are. The reason all of this news is so exhausting is not because Dr. Ford's story is surprising. It's because it's not surprising at all nor is the way that she's been treated and discounted. Melinda is a fictional character, but she could just as easily be any 34-year-old woman watching Dr. Ford tell a story of a high school party that went wrong and remembering her own version of that story. And like a lot of women, I bet she's pissed. So thank you guys for watching. If you've read Speak and you want to talk about it with me below, let me know your thoughts, um, just either about, what the, about the book or what I've discussed here. Um, and yeah, just take care of yourselves. Um, the midterms are coming up, so if you are in the U.S. and you're able to vote, make sure you register. If you are like me and you need to make sure to get an absentee ballot, do that. This is my way of reminding myself and you, because um, I definitely need to make sure that I am all set. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for watching, and bye!